Hello and welcome to No Summary, Golden Thread's live stream series of conversations with artists that don't fit in a box. For those who may not know, Golden Thread is the first American theater company uh, devoted to plays from or about the Middle East. We are based in San Francisco and we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. My name is Sara uh, Rezavi or Sara Razavi, depending on who I'm speaking with. And as we have talked about with many Golden Thread uh, conversations, we as Middle Easterns, uh, as Middle Eastern artists, often have to navigate just how we even pronounce our names and to whom. Uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, Sara Razavi, I'm an artist. Uh, at Golden Thread, I'm a uh, resident artist, uh, specifically as an actor and a director. But I also, and primarily now, work as an executive in community-based lending in what's called the Community Development Financial Institution Industry. I'm the CEO of a company called Working Solutions CDFI. We do small business micro lending uh, serving the nine Bay Area counties. I brought all of that, uh, my theater and sociology major and background, as well as the MBA graduate to my connection with Golden Thread. Uh, and part of today's conversation is about bringing that whole self to, uh, to the fore in how we talk about our art and, and the work that we do, uh, the multitudes, the multiplicities of our of selves and our artistic selves. I met Toranj uh, Yegazarian, the founding artistic director of Golden Thread back in 2002, when I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, and when she had recently launched Golden Thread. We met then to discuss how I could help with a children's education program. I'd done some similar work back at, uh, as an undergraduate student at UC Davis. So we connected. She found out I also acted, and as she's known to do, she encouraged me to audition. From there, she also encouraged me to join the board, and I did both those things and have been in some service and support uh, to Golden Thread since. In the midst of all that, while I was very much delineating uh, my queer identity from my Middle Eastern identity, it was at Golden Thread and the community of artists that I met through it that I realized those two worlds don't need to live separately. And that was a really novel idea. In fact, I remember going to a Golden Thread cast party before I knew the company very well, before I was even in a show and telling my girlfriend who I brought with me at the time that we simply couldn't show that we were together. Now, remember, this is a golden thread theater cast party. That means we're in the Bay Area. I think it was even in San Francisco. And uh, it, was, it was a theater cast party. I mean, the idea that queerness in the Bay and the arts had to be separate is crazy when I look, look back on it, think back on it, but that's where my head was. And I was so sure of that because it felt so important to me to keep that Middle Eastern and queerness identity so separate. Well, I was very wrong. And there are others here today to talk about their experience through the already complicated landscape of Middle Eastern identities. We talked about that name bit. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but also Middle East to what? Person of color, not of color, new democracies, old civilizations, there's a lot going on. And in the midst of all that, also holding up our queerness can prove a challenge. So I'm joined today by three other artists to hear how they have navigated uh, this for themselves and how they've integrated their multiple selves into their life and their work. I'll briefly introduce them and then ask each of them to introduce themselves. First, Kenan Arun is a Turkish makeup designer and Golden Thread resident artist, as well as the director of operations at the LGBT Asylum Project. Kenan, please go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much for having me and having the other artists, and thank you so much for putting this. No summary, it's, I love that uh, we don't fit in a box. I love that saying, and that's what we're going to talk about today. My name is Kenan and I am from Turkey. I'm a Turkish gay man 
and I moved to United States in 2013. I was in Los Angeles first. And after I graduated from cinema makeup school, I moved to San Francisco and met Golden Thread Productions and started working with them as a makeup designer and makeup artist. And um, I am the director of operations for the LGBT Asylum Project and Okan Immigration Law Group. And that falls really well with the identities and personas that we have because with the LGBT Asylum Project, we are offering free legal services for LGBT asylum seekers out of the countries who flee their country, who had to flee their countries because of persecution and mistreatment. And it is the same with Okan Immigration Law Group and we're doing political cases for that. And we do have LGBT cases in Okan Immigration Law Group as well, but it is for basically four people who are not welcome because of their identities and because they wanna live their authentic selves. And I'm a singing member uh, for San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. And we do a lot of drag work with Drunk Drag Broadway and with SFGMC Divas, basically to raise funds and, and to have fun. It's a community work as well, but we do sing and we produce art all together in drag. Thank you. Thank you, Kenan. Second, we have uh, Amin El Gamal, who is an Egyptian American actor, active in theater, film, and television. Amin, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Golden Thread means a lot to me. Um, I've had a relationship with Turange and the company in some capacity for over a decade. Um, I am a, a first generation Egyptian American Muslim queer <laughs> um, artist. Um, I got my roots in theater. Um, I felt very alone as a child and unlovable. I never really saw representations of people like me. I felt that I was fighting, you know, several battles. There's the front of Islamophobia and xenophobia and the front of you know, homophobia, and um, it felt easier for me to keep to myself. So I, I became like a keen observer of life, which is a very important, I think, aspect for any artist. Um, and then discovered theater, which is where I felt like I could express myself through the safety and the guise of a character. Um, I eventually moved to LA to get my MFA, and I never expected <laughs> to, to live in LA, which I do now. Um, or to be acting in film and television, but that's where I am. Um, and along the way, my mother, unknowingly or not, instilled in me this keen um, and fierce pride in who I am. I remember once she was reading us um, a bedtime story, the Narnia books, and at one point in the Narnia series, all the bad guys have turbans and they're brown. And I remember my mom reading it and being like, you don't need this crap. So that was the first time I understood how um, story important storytelling can be in terms of uh, self-acceptance, but also in terms of changing global perceptions and policy. And that's something that's, I've been very, um, that's been very important to me. I founded a group for LGBT Muslims and most people with Muslim background years and years ago in LA. And a lot of that was based around storytelling. Um, I also co-founded uh, an advocacy group with actress Azita Ghanizada, who's Afghan American. Um, and we were making, you know, small inroads in Hollywood in recognizing Middle Eastern and North African folks as uh, a diverse category which you will be surprised, um, we're either considered white <laughs> and not counted or we're too ethnic, it's, but nothing makes any sense. Um, and I've done work with the IRC for refugee resettlement. Um, basically, I spend a lot of my time when I'm not acting engaged in advocacy. Um, and I made a very strong choice to be out about my Muslimness and about my queerness and about my Arabness, um, and that's been an exciting journey. I think someone, I, I don't know if this is factually true, but somewhere on the internet, it says that I'm the first openly queer Muslim actor to have a, had a lead role on a television show. So, which is shocking to me, um, but I, yeah, I feel like I am in some ways blazing a trail, not in that I am so great or anything, but that 
I feel like I'm writing the journey. I don't think the journey for someone like me has really been written yet. So that's me. Thank you so much for being here. There's so much to unpack there. Exactly. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I love your shirt. Yes, I, I noticed oh, yeah. that as well. Thank you for representing yes. and, and representation all around. Um, so I'm going to bring on our final panelist, Hamaira Piruso, uh, an Afghan American writer, activist, and cultural advisor for theater, film, and television. Please go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, especially since I'm the only cis, non-queer, female identifying member of this group. And so truly we both fit in a box. Um, I am a cultural advisor. Um, I work on cultural authenticity, mostly around Afghanistan and uh, the Islamic world uh, with theater, um, film, and television. Um, so my role basically as a cultural advisor is to bring authenticity to the script, to do language coaching for um, any of the actors, as well as work with directors, costume, and such. And um, actually, I became involved with Golden Thread Community before I did any of this type of cultural advisory work. Um, I met Taranj, and of course, we all have Taranj in common, um, and was part of the community um, as someone who supported the, the programming. I hosted one of the playwrights at my house, um, and uh, at one point, I was lucky enough to actually uh, work on a project um, with Taranj and the rest of the Golden Thread team, uh, which was the most dangerous highway, uh, which was set in Afghanistan. And um, uh, aside from my um, cultural advisory work, I'm one of those people that has a portfolio of jobs. So I definitely, definitely don't fit in a box. Uh, so along with my cultural advisory work, I also um, write a blog about Afghan food and culture. Um, I have a YouTube channel where I share Afghan culture uh, through my cooking classes. And I've started doing a lot of um, informational videos about the plight of Afghan women and what the current peace process and Afghanistan's um, uh, abandonment by the world that is upcoming in September with the US withdrawal will affect the Afghan people. Um, I'm currently also working with a cohort of theater makers in the Bay Area um, on a program called Making Good Trouble Anti-Racist Work. Um, and we are um, supported by uh, Playwrights Foundation, Magic Theater, and um, hey, I forgot the last theater's name, sorry about that. Um, uh, so anyway, we're all getting anti-racist training and we hope to bring what we are uh, working uh, on to first our Bay Area theater community, but then to the larger world because we just feel that the, uh, the systematic racism um, towards BIPOC community has been um, going on for a long time. And it's going to take a lot of work both on um, the advocacy as well as the artist side to make these changes. Um, but the reason I am on this panel is because I have a queer son. Um, he's a, a transgender and uh, transitioned um, who actually came out to us uh, around five years ago. And um, I'm really proud to be his mom and it has tremendously changed my life. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. What an amazing panel. I think all those who are listening and who are watching can appreciate what a diverse group of representation uh, here. But a through line definitely is the advocacy work. So we will come back to that, each of you in your own way, advocating for uh, issues that you believe, of course, overlap with your identities. Uh, but let's start with that identity. Queer, Middle Eastern, artist, you fill in the blank. What do you think of when you hear those words? Are they identifiers for you? All of them, none of them, or in any particular order? This time, I mean, we'll begin with you. 
It's really, I, I don't, I wouldn't say, I do identify with all of those terms um, and, and they, they overlap to me, you know, to be an immigrant in some ways is to be queer. I have a lot of friends who are first gen like me or are immigrants and we have a chosen family, much like the traditional, you know, queer model. Um, and in terms of my religious identity, I find Islam to be <laughs> very queer. Um, going back to like the Prophet Muhammad apparently had a transgender servant and there was a lot of sexual and gender diversity back in the day, you know, before the Western colonialism. But also the idea that you have your own relationship with your own higher power and no one can interfere with that feels very individualistic and very queer and honoring that everyone is different and has different perspectives. So I see a lot of, um, I haven't always <laughs> felt this way. I mean, I, I think I abandoned a lot of my um, cultural background when I was first coming out because I felt like if, you know, if this culture doesn't believe I exist or if this God says that I'm wrong, then, you know, screw that. Um, it wasn't until after grad school, I discovered an organization called Muslims for Progressive Values and seeing that there was a mosque where women could lead, where they didn't have to wear a, you know, a hijab, where they could, you know, queer people could, you know, kiki in an iftar, you know, on Ramadan. It was like, really blew my mind. And I was like, you know, I, I feel like I felt robbed of my mm -hmm. Arabness and my Middle Easternness and my Muslimness. And who has a right to tell me that I am not any of these things because I am a certain way. Yeah. So it was really, it's such a blessing and a privilege to be able to pull from different parts of your identity and be your fullest self. Um, so I don't, I, I find that all of these intersect. I think the fact that I was queer and marginalized because of being queer and because of being um, Arab and North African and Muslim led to me expressing myself as an artist, you know, that's changed. And now as an artist, I give back um, yeah. with visibility and advocacy. So I, I find them yeah. all so intermeshed. Yeah, that point of feeling robbed if you silo those identities, that definitely resonates. Hamira, I would love to hear your perspective on those identifiers, queer, Middle Eastern, artist, fill in the blank, parent of. Yes. Well, um, so of course I, um, I, I, first of all, everything um, that uh, you all are saying is really resonating with me and, and making me realize that all the work each of us is doing is going to make our children's future better so you don't feel robbed anymore. I definitely, to be honest with you, I don't identify with any of those because uh, to me, artist seems like such an elevated thing. And I don't know if I'm an artist, even though I am creative. Uh, I'm not queer. Um, uh, and I'm really not Middle Eastern. I'm from Afghanistan, which is in Central Asia. But um, what I do feel is that I am part of this community of the incredible artists, um, all of you and um, in all of Bay Area and the theater world. Um, and I feel so close to um, queerness because there are a lot of people in our community who are, which basically tells me how could one be normal or accepted and the other one isn't. I mean, if truly um, God or Allah created us and um, then why would any of this be wrong or, or unacceptable or should be hidden. Um, I fortunately grew up with a brother who um, is queer and I feel like he was really the one charting um, the territory for um, Afghan um, queer men um, because he was one of the first people that came out publicly and our family was definitely um, shunned and this was we we're talking about like 40 years ago mm -hmm. um, so it was a very very difficult time but one of the things that I do have to say is that my parents despite the fact that they struggled with this and being shunned from the community they really um, accepted him and 
they didn't always understand it. Like my dad would be, he actually made an attempt to go to pride parade and was like, what is happening here? He was trying to understand it. So I feel like <laughs> I, uh, I was, and, uh, but I really, in retrospect, appreciated their effort to understand, even though they didn't 100% get it. And I feel like what they passed on to me has affected how I accepted my son and helped him in his journey. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll keep we'll keep talking through that, but want to give uh, Kenan a time uh, to respond to the question as well. Uh, again, queer, Middle Eastern artist, you fill in the blanks. What what do you find with those words? It is. I mean, I can totally resonate with what Amin and Humaira just said because of having multiple identities. It's like um, Diamond has many facades. So you don't have to be just one thing that's, in, I mean, you, you can, but most of the time it's different bubbles and you basically use what you have with one information in the other one and they overlap for sure. And um, I don't necessarily take myself as um, Muslim. I was raised Muslim, yes, but I would I basically approach it to more culture than religion. And um, I like owning up to how we are raised. Like who says I'm not a Muslim? I mean, I can't say that. It's not somebody else's. Or like I mean said, like who says I'm not a queer Arab because I am here and we do exist. So nobody can rob me off of that. So um, I like having different personas and identities of um, multiple facades that we all own up to. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. I grew up in, in a, many Iranians, a majority are, of course, Muslim, Shia Muslim, but uh, I grew up in a, a Zoroastrian family who had converted uh, generations back. And I, it was always hard because, yeah, you go into these spaces, uh, join the Persian group on campus and felt way too queer and not Muslim enough. <laughs> I was just like, I can't be uh, anywhere quite right, but sitting in theater and finding golden threads. And I joke with Tarant, I don't think I've ever actually represented an Iranian on stage, but I've represented an Afghan, an Egyptian, and, and so on. It's been so fun to, um, to take on the different parts and to let shine, like you're saying, um, parts that I do know and I recognize, oh yeah, I didn't feel quite 100% part of the majority, but this is what I brought to that minority lens, wherever that was, because there's always that piece of, of bringing in a different lens, a different, I like that, I'm imagining a diamond uh, in, um, about the, the different lights piercing through as you move it around and it's going to shine through in a different way. Beautiful. Thank you all for that general answer. Uh, back to you, Kenan. Uh, makeup and immigration work, as you introduced at the Asylum Center, these sound like very distant, distant from each other. How do you combine them? So um, they do seem very distant, but they are not actually, because it's all about identities and personas as well. Theater is um, creating storytelling, as I mean said as well, on stage um, and having different characters come to life and makeup helps that. And the immigration work that I do, it helps um, people who couldn't survive in a certain environment to leave that behind and start over in a place that they chose to with a chosen family, chosen society, however you wanna say it. So it overlaps in the means of finding oneself, whether it's like a short period of, of time when you're on stage representing someone else that you're not, or maybe um, you are, and you are basically making it a platform for yourself and then raising awareness. And the immigration work falls under finding your authentic self and living your own truth. And it all comes down to however you live your life in a very microcosmic way, becomes advocacy and activism because you have the right you find you give yourself the right to live however you want to live 
So I like that they're overlapping. They, they seem very distant, but they are totally together. Give yourself the right. That's so beautiful. And that goes back to, thank you. That goes back to, I mean, you'd mentioned, and it's, it's sticking in my head, and I think it's resonated for all of us, this feeling of, in some ways, if we don't, we're robbing ourselves and allowing to be robbed of the multiplicity, the plurality. Um, so thank you for raising that. It's wonderful at a certain age and maybe in the right communities. And I think all of us have been blessed to have this opportunity. You can sit back and say, wait a minute, I don't need to silo all of these. They can live, but it does take having an example, whether Amira, it's in your uh, brother's example, or uh, I mean, in, in finding this opportunity in the history books and looking back, or Kanan really thinking about the stories of the refugees and asylum seekers that you speak with, that there's similarity enough and there's diversity enough. And so much in, and I've found over the years, in the diaspora culture, folks end up wanting so much to tie back to the old world, whatever that old world is, and being so rigid about what it looks like. But when you go back to the home countries, of course there's diversity. You don't have to define being you know, Turkish or Egyptian or Afghan or, or Iranian in a certain way. You can be a punk rock star Iranian and nobody's gonna blink an eye because you know, there's others around you. So I hope that's what's coming through. That's certainly what I'm hearing a lot from everything you guys are saying. Uh, let me, let's talk about uh, you and your responsibility, if any, as an American artist who is queer and of MENA descent. What you said, you have found out you might've been one of the first openly queer uh, Muslim men actors represent, you know, that's that's a lot of identifiers I had. Yeah. But how do you carry that? It kind of boggles the mind. Cause I think this show I did in like 2017 and I was like, how, how is this possible? <laughs> but, I, but after I did that, more people came out. They're, they're, I'm not the only one that I know of anymore who's openly queer and identifies as Muslim and is in the business. So like you said, it's about, you know, I might've made sacrifices. I have no idea by being so open about who I am. I'm sure I have, but um, I don't see the points of being someone who is a storyteller and who makes a living doing it. And sometimes has to make compromises on those things. Like, I, I don't see a point to me other than speaking out and being visible. Um, and to, so that I feel is my responsibility, you know, not only to be like, hey, look, I'm Muslim, I'm not scary, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't deserve to be banned, um, but also in the more rigid, potentially mainstream Muslim communities to also to challenge those barriers that might be imposed. Um, an important example of that, I think, is a, a film I did recently that's called Breaking Fast that opened earlier this year. And it's a, a, rom, a queer Muslim rom-com that takes place during Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, it, Cause we uh, don't have enough of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I play the kind of funny best friend with a <laughs> twist. Um, but I initially, when I first saw the script, I was sort of like, well, I don't know, this doesn't seem very radical. You know, this is like a, you know, page by page, it's a rom-com. This is so like, you know, frothy and silly. <clears throat> and I sort of reluctantly went into it. And I was so wrong because the movie came out, uh, unfortunately it couldn't have a theatrical release because of COVID, but it's available for rent. And hopefully it'll be streaming on some platform soon. It's a, a VOD right now. But the response that we've gotten has been in incredible. All over the world, even though it's not technically released in other countries, people are contacting me. Um, I had a family member who came out to me. Mm. It's been very difficult. I mean, my family is progressive and supportive, but you know, they're also <laughs> Muslim Egyptian immigrants and it's been a really difficult negotiation for, um, for this person. And watching the movie um, made them comfortable enough to come out to me, which was very special. And I just keep hearing all these stories about how <clears throat> a movie that 
is a rom-com that sets up an ideal about who is worthy of love and centers queer, you know, POC, Mina, love. Um, however entertaining and silly and funny it might be um, in a way that kind of makes it subversive. Um, and I've also heard other stories from people who are hungered, who have a hunger for Middle Eastern, authentic Middle Eastern content. And like Arab culture is very prevalent in this movie. So they come to the movie for that, wanting to see themselves represented. And then they end up coming away with this sort of opening their minds about um, queer Muslims and the the they, it seems like an inherent paradox but this movie just you know kind of blows that out of the water so that's my, my responsibility is um as an artist i recognize that not everyone does that and i i respect that i have a certain level of privilege to be able to do that yeah yeah but that that's we don't even appreciate uh I think that's an interesting point you just raised. Uh, how how powerful normalizing can be, you know, normalizing that uh, love can be, and uh, you know, it's beautiful and yeah. it does not need to be, uh, you know, exceptionalized. <laughs> yeah, Hollywood, <laughs> you know, theater too. The mm -hmm. stories continue to be, you know we have dark there's you know we've we are in some sense like you know victims in our region of the world and there's a lot of darkness but we don't allow you know we don't allow joy you know we don't allow characters from our backgrounds and of our identity intersections to experience joy and I just found that so refreshing yeah and not unlike, I mean, that piece of, uh, of uh, queer identity as, uh, as being joyful is new actually in, in the larger sphere as well. So let alone adding a layer of uh, diversity and other and immigrants to that, you're absolutely right, which you end up seeing as, as sad stories. And that's been one of the stories about uh, Golden Thread. As a board member, we'd sit through and think, you know, about these strategic plans uh, and one of the things that I remember one of uh, the board members, I respected them a lot, would say, I just want to go to the theater and laugh. Can we just laugh? Can we, <laughs> you know, and, and that's what's been great about some of the productions uh, is this intentionality about comedy, about the balance of humor in everyday life, um, that even when something is difficult, uh, you know, especially cultures use humor to bring light to it and to have a conversation around it. Yeah, I mean, can we, I, can we use that's that? so healing mm -hmm. to, for the community. And also, like, it's better art. You know what I mean? Even in the most dire situation, <laughs> there's, there's stupid, funny, weird things that happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's really lots of fun. Um, Hamira. Your story, and you, you touched on this, um, what has been your personal experience as a mother to someone? I know when you said that, my brain went, my, you know, that's when in my head with my experience with my own mother, I would imagine the other panelists as well, our relationships with our families in their ability to uh, accept and recognize, but also in their identification as a parent of someone who is queer. Um, would love to hear more about that from you. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, when when we're pregnant, a couple, um, we lie to ourselves all the time and say, "If only my child is healthy, I will be happy." Um, nobody really, when they're saying that, thinks, "If only my child is healthy." and not on a spectrum, but within this box. And I, you know, dresses this way, talks this way, loves this person, will I be happy? Um, and I think that's the dichotomy that a lot of people are in is that they look at their children as a reflection of themselves. And therefore, when a child um, is queer or whatever may be the situation. Um, and it, we're not seeing our own reflection. There's like, whoa, what's happening here? Um, and in my case, actually, it was a little bit different. Um, my son um, was very, um, 
I would say gender neutral from age two. Um, he didn't like wearing anything that was not black or brown. Uh, he did not like wearing anything that was not pants, sweats and such. So we kind of grew up with this child who was different. And what was really interesting to me was that's exactly how I was when I was a little girl. I wanted to be a boy. I had my hair short. I dressed in boys clothes and such. So I was like, oh, well, you know, chip off the old block. Um, and, and we let him express himself any which way he wanted. Um, but with all that openness, with all my own experience with my brother also being queer, when he came out as trans to us, I thought I was hit by a truck. I mean, literally, like for two weeks, morning, day, night, I just kept saying in my head, transgender, transgender, and like what all that means in our society, how horrible his life is going to be, how is this going to work, is he going to be marginalized, are people going to hate him, blah, blah, blah. Of course, to him, we projected the sense of like, we, we've got our shit together, but in my head, I literally thought my head was going to burst. So, you know, for all the queer people out there, if somebody like me, who is open-minded, I live in San Francisco, I had this kind of experience. Imagine your parent who is, you know, in a much more insular type of situation. Um, once I was able to stop that ruminating, I literally like laid on a couch not in front of a therapist, but by myself for a week, I could barely like get up. And I think for me, the biggest thing was like, will he live in the margins of society? Will he live a happy life? Will he find love? Will people treat him um, as a human being, as part of their community and such? Um, and of course, over time, and that's what one of the most amazing things about human beings are we, we hopefully adapt and accept and such. Um, thankfully, my husband and I and our um, daughter uh, were all in the same page and we just put everything behind supporting him. And my family came on board very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, my mom, my aunts, they were just like, yeah, what's the big deal? Uh, especially since uh, the transition was from female to male. That's definitely a thing in the in our community. If it was reverse, I think it would have been a little bit harder. I was really impressed by my Afghan friends, especially the new immigrants when I shared with them. It was just like, oh, Mubarak, you know, congratulations. Uh, so I've been really, really, really grateful to my community for being so supportive to Sutter and um, what he has been through. We navigated a lot of the school things and, and you know, things like that. Um, that within itself is a freaking full-time job, I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was really no playbook and it still isn't. And I uh, really advise a lot of people on what the steps are, whoever, you know, uh, contacts me. But one of the things that has done for me is that I have become a much more empathetic, open-minded person who's able to think about a situation from many facets than just one way. And, um, and I'm like, I'm so grateful that, you know, my son is such a strong person who is able to stand and be proud. Um, he's a very, introverted person so he's not always running around you know showing his queerness but one of the things that I I want to share with our community is please don't hide these things because what happens is when I feel that when you hide this kind of information not only them are you damaging yourself because that information is going to eventually become an ulcer inside you but you are communicating to your child cousin, brother, whatever, that you're ashamed of them somehow. Mm -hmm. And that is very, very detrimental. And that's one of the things my husband and I decided at the beginning is that we're going to send one blanket email explaining what has happened and owning our own story. Uh, because if you don't own your story, 
then there's going to be all kinds of stories out there. And I know it's part of our culture to hide things and, you know, and say to this person, not that person, blah, blah, blah. Just own your story, tell it as it is. Yeah. And then you are the one that is managing your narrative. Totally. I love that. Own your, own your story, tell May I your narrative. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Humaira, for not hiding a major approach as well when you were talking about not hiding yourself and acknowledging the fact that it would have been much different if it was from male to female. That's something that needs that had to be addressed. And thank you so, so much for saying that out loud. You're welcome. Yeah. I want to pause just for a moment. Uh, there's never quite the right time, but for those who are just joining us, uh, just a reminder, this is no summary. Golden Threads live stream series of conversations with artists that don't fit in a box. We are here in conversation with the beautiful artists today. You may post your questions to Golden Threads Facebook Live for our artists to respond to. We have a, a little over 20 minutes uh, left of this conversation, which I hope will continue to stay forward. But yeah, I want to uh, pick up on a couple of things uh, that, that were just said uh, by Humaira. One, um, that this point about the female to male, Kanan, you just raised that as well. Certainly, similarly, queer identities sometimes more acceptable with lesbian, uh, uh, those identifying as lesbian versus gay, what's accepted. Um, we've heard some of that as well. But so much of it comes down to shame, internalized shame and fear. And, uh, you know, as a parent myself, and as I've gotten older, you have these moments of like, oh yeah, they don't know everything. <laughs> so, so that reaction they had right away was a very human and not all knowing reaction. And so yeah, in my own experience, uh, a very open-minded, very liberal uh, upbringing. And yet when I came out to, to my mother now over 25 years ago, her immediate response had been, it's a phase, keep it in the family, don't mention it to anybody. And what that ended up doing is actually distancing me from many family for many years. Um, and I remember I was in a car driving with a cousin. We were going to a wedding and she just casually was like, so you got any boyfriends you want to tell me about? And I said, no. And she's like, girlfriends? <laughs> and she was so casual about it. And my mom was in the car and I remember looking right away to my mom like, can I, can I tell her? And my mom just like tightened up and I thought, well, I guess not. Um, but I think, you know, I think that's why it just resonated as well. Family will surprise you. Uh, extended family will surprise you in ways because there are some things that are very clear uh, in the love that's shared in the nuclear family um, that's really stemmed from fear and concern. Um, but the extended family can really participate more in the joy of things and, and so grateful for them as well. Um, so a couple a couple more questions back to you, uh, Kanan. Um, why, what do you do? Uh, you, this question, what do you do to give back to the community? Uh, you and I had talked about these beforehand. I feel like you give a lot uh, to the community in every work that you do, but can you, can you? As we that? all do, yeah. 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 Um, I am, um, I like having a platform uh, especially with Golden Thread. And uh, I want to highlight that, that like, because I'm a makeup designer and makeup in theater is not really mentioned that much. It is, it always and falls under costumes. You guys worked on a project together, The Most Dangerous Highway. We yeah. did. You did yes. that amazing makeup. Exactly. Yeah, tell us more about that too. So um, with Golden Thread, I'm using that platform to, basically for political place to, um, to have the visibility and raising awareness, that's for sure. And having Humaira, uh, when we were doing the most dangerous highway, I was like, I asked the simplest questions possible going, so do I have to do like a really bold eye makeup to this uh, character? And she said, no, no, she's in hiding. So we're not doing that. Let's keep her simple like that. So it, it follows the narrative as well. So, and having a um, cultural consultant mm -hmm. with you is perfect. Yeah. 
And in addition to my work um, with the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, I'm a singing member, but it's a community uh, for, again, raising awareness on identities, diversity, however you want to say it. And we have multiple programs, uh, especially the one that I really enjoy is Rhythm. It's reaching youth through music. And we are having assemblies. It, I mean, before COVID, it was in person. We were showing up to the schools and then singing about coming out identities, multiple things with songs blended in between. It was a very short, like 30 minute concert. Uh, we started doing that online as we are speaking, actually, there's one going on um, over Zoom with the chorus. I'm, I'm so happy to do that. And uh, I also do the, with SFGMC Divas, I'm using my makeup for drag. And I want to add something um, here because I don't want to shave when I'm in drag. I basically keep my beard. And one of my friends ended up telling me, oh, like, I really like that you're keeping it androgynous and non-binary. I'm like, no, no, I'm just lazy. But, <laughs> but I like that. But I like how it seemed uh, that I was just like, I, I would go for that. And I totally didn't. I'm telling it to everyone. And um, and I like, it's, it's basically, this is what I'm doing is applicable to all of us. And I want to highlight something Toran says all the time. It takes a village to raise a kid. And it takes a village to, for us to do what we do. We have multiple aspects that we're bringing together and forming something out of that and putting it on our platforms to speak up, to raise awareness, not hiding, as Humeira said. We're sharing our stories so that there is a bold story for someone to look up to or like however they want to approach it. Yeah, yeah. Visibility comes in just, yeah, uh, in that, in, in, in showing all sides of yourself so that people can tell, oh, there's, a, there's that way to be as well. You can be a drag queen with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You look gorgeous, actually, when, when you do. And uh, there are so many aspects uh, of, of your work, the, the, your, your musicality with both song and instrument, your flute uh, as well. Uh, as oh yeah, thank you. It, it gives such, col it colors so many parts of our identities. Uh, it's, it's and also with Drunk Drag Broadway, Drunk Drag Broadway is our drag troupe company and we perform at Oasis and they always do a fundraiser. They have done uh -huh. fundraisers for the LGBT Asylum Project and Jimmy Moore always says, he's the uh, artistic director. And he says, we're doing drag for activism. So it's again like art for activism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, how do we tell stories that are that are a little bit that are removed from that straight white gaze? How do we make our identities without pandering? We talked a little bit about this through your work already, but you want to highlight a little bit more? If you're thinking yeah, I mean, I think. That is an open question that I want everyone who's watching this to ponder. Um, I have felt some recently frustrated with the limitations of, of being an actor. A lot of times, especially in film and TV, you kind of come in at the very end of the process and you don't really have a lot of say as to some of the choices you make, even some of the most minute things. Sometimes I was on a show that I was on multiple episodes of and the director for one of the episodes, we were having trouble with landing a certain joke and making the script work. And I had all these ideas and they just wouldn't listen to me. And I was like, what, what's mm -hmm. happening? What, I can't. So that's, that's like a limitation of the profession of acting. And I realized that I'm someone who has to, who wants to have creative say, but then also I'm, I, I can get very frustrated with what I'm considered for and what mm -hmm. um, the limited way that I'm sometimes seen. In, in film and TV, but also in theater. A lot of times I'll get a script and it's a queer Muslim thing, but I'm just like, this, this, this is explaining the situation to an outside audience. This is pandering this is going into the tragic queer, you know, queer Arab trope. And I just don't wanna see it. You know, I don't wanna be part of that. So I think it takes a lot of mindfulness because I'm now, turning to writing because I'm frustrated with, with acting and I want to have more of a creative say. Um, and even in myself, I find as I'm outlining like a new script, I find myself going towards the story that is expected of me to tell, you know? So um, 
I'm not sure if I know exactly how to do that, but I thought it was a compelling question. Yeah. <laughs> and it's something that's very actively on my mind. It's how, how can I, um, how can I go away from um, being seen for what I am and, and move towards being seen for who I am? You know, the, the privilege that a, um, a white purse actor has or a white storyteller has of just examining the human experience versus having to do it through this, like, let me explain the culture and then also let me do this. And then let me, you know, fall into this thing where I have to lean on identity or whatever. Um, Oteranj said, what about drowning in Cairo? Yeah. Drowning in Cairo was good, was, was special because it was an experience. It was about uh, a raid in, in Egypt on a gay uh, party boat um, and how that ruined people's lives. And I think that is a true story and it's important to examine. Um, and I think that story has not been told and there's not a lot of awareness about, about that. At the same time, too, I, I want to see a diversity of stories that's not um, giving fuel to demonize the Middle East for, for being homophobic. Another reason to, you know, dehumanize that region. And also, I just want to see stories that are not necessarily tragic. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of people in Egypt who have vibrant gay lives. I mean, they live in danger. That's real. But they have underground lives that are vibrant and, you know, they figure out how to make it work. So I'd love to see that play too, you know? Yeah, well, again, the nuance, play, learning and, and living in the nuance. Uh, but, uh, you know, in theater and any work of art, it's a moment in time that you're telling, even if it expands multiple years or generations. Uh, so, you know, and, and, it, and the most effective art does hone in on a, 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 a feeling, a story, a, specific, a specificity, and then allows interpretation so when you are representing, uh, you know, any kind of minority experience, it can feel so frustrating because you're trying to hone in on that moment and then you go, but there's so much more to say. There's so many uh, moments, but, you know, and that's, I think um, anybody who is other than white male, uh, whenever they're producing anything, it becomes either a woman's story or a you know queer mm -hmm. story and immediately triggers a, a perception for people it's a mm -hmm. middle eastern story oh it's going to be about war it's going to be about conflict it's queer going it's going to be about, about coming out you know yes yes and not that the stories are not valid but you know at a, at a certain point we get siloed and then you know in Turanj, i've talked about this with Turanj and with other and with and with the director of breaking fast mike musallam Mm -hmm. um, Breaking Fast is a comedy, and he was very strict about, he's Lebanese American, and was very strict about having, uh, he was like, here, these are all the, the Arab countries that people have background from that are acceptable in my, in this movie, I want to get casting right to the casting director. So a lot of Arab actors came, and, and because they're trained to be brooding and scary, and they're rewarded for play, playing into this colonial orientalist narrative they weren't even able to find like the funny in the script in this like rom-com and I remember Taranj talking about witnessing actors going to Hollywood and getting trained to be you know like scary and whatever and then they come back and they just are like there's rigidity there's this sort of deadness which I find like really sad um and I think I'm not sure what my point is <laughs> talking about that we can be trained out of humor is i think where you're headed that even if we yeah. have it intrinsically you know what well, that, well, that's what happens when we're not mindful about like if we have to like i've played roles that i find problematic you know one of the biggest roles i played was like a riff on a stereotype and i did what i could on this on broadcast television to make it a human but i never you know, I knew exactly what I was doing. Like, I never bought into like, oh, this is, oh, whatever. Like, I guess, you know, it's okay. Terrorism on TV and these stereotypes are all great. You know, I never lost sight. I never lost sight of trying to make him human. And I knew that I was exploiting myself to move forward in my career, but I was doing it myself, you know? And yeah, the, the joke was going to be on that. Yeah. Owning your narrative. And only each of you individually will know that. Um, and, and what, what is portrayed by one actor, by one writer, by one designer, 
uh, can be almost the same, but the intentionality is, is really what's going to color that experience for all those involved. And that intentionality comes down to your self-knowledge. Sure, can I jump in there? Um, mm -hmm. I'm putting on my cultural advisory hat and I want to um, uh, raise what Amina um, mentioned earlier, which is that by the time the actors come into it, it's so far uh, along. And that's one of the things as a cultural advisor, I try to do is get me involved in the script writing, teleplay, you know, because that is where really a lot of the nuances are going to be um, yeah. set ahead of time. And especially if it's television or film, there's so many layers of approval that by the time it gets to the actor, there's no room for change. Um, and often I find that when I'm brought in early enough, then I can bring some authenticity and humanity into it. Um, like, yeah, we do laugh in Afghanistan, even though it's been a war or, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there are so many things that like just attributed directly to certain cultures um, that can't be, that, that's continually replicated, but you can mitigate it at the level when they're filming. It's too late. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're totally talking. right. You, we could keep talking, yeah, you guys, but unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time together. I want to thank uh, our guests today, uh, Kanem Arun, Amin Al Gamal, and Hamaira Gilzai. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, and I'd like to also thank HowlRound for hosting this live stream event. A recording of this session will be available both on HowlRound and on Golden Thread's websites. Many thanks to our live stream technicians, Wendy Reyes and Chris Steele for managing the live stream on Golden Thread's Facebook page. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Again, we could have spoken a lot longer. Uh, we were just getting into it. I was just brewing the tea. So we were about <laughs> to get, get down. But uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Really this conversation about just naming it there are queers in our communities, our communities are diverse, and we welcome these stories just as much as we welcome uh, any of the stories that make up the plethora, the diversity of the Middle East and the regions surrounding it. So thank you again for everybody for your time. And with that, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Time. Thank you.